Good morning, everyone, or maybe it's good afternoon for some of you. Uh, Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of the show. Today, we've got Martin Popoff once again in the co-captain's chair. We, this, is a, this is a kind of by-request show, so we've had all these people asking for, Pete, can you and Martin do a show where you talk about bands you feel are underrated? And we've had a lot of viewers ask for this. And Martin, I just I threw it out to Martin a couple of weeks ago. It's like, what do you think about this idea? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, I think Martin's first thing he said to me is like, well, underrated for who? For us? It's like, well, I guess, right? And we, we were tossing the idea around. We were originally not going to do it because we were like, well, you know, what, what does underrated really mean? And I think we finally came on a common ground where we felt that uh, underrated has to be kind of a bands that we like and respect that had all the attributes to be a much bigger band at the time where they were around, but for whatever reason, never quite made it. So we went through a whole bunch of bands we were considering. And there, I think some, you know, there were some that I wanted to pick that's like, well, I feel they're underrated because they, it would have been nice if they were bigger. But if you listen to their music, you understand why they were never bigger, or, you know, that sort of thing. And that was kind of the key point. So I don't know, Martin, if you want to touch on this topic a little bit before we start talking about our Yeah, music. yeah, that, that was an interesting discussion. I, I get in this argument all the time with people, and especially when you go the negative and talk about overrated bands, right? It's like, you know, I, I always think of, I, I worship Led Zeppelin but they're probably overrated, right? Because they're rated so high, right? So it's easy to be overrated when you're rated that high. Guns and Roses, good album, Appetite for Dis uh, Destruction, I like it. I, I maybe even love it, but I mean, are they overrated? I mean, probably because they're rated so, so high, right? So, so we got in, into this discussion about underrated and then I remember we talked about Budgie, right? And then we were thinking, well, I mean, should they, should they be rated way higher? I mean, you think of all the sort of like oddness to them or, or whatever, right? So that's how we, you know, we stumbled upon this idea that, that, you know, if you check off all the boxes and, and you really truly in your heart believe out there in the real world, why wasn't this band bigger? Um, the, and, and it confuses you why they weren't bigger. I mean, that to me feels like a, a like a good definition of underrated, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what we've done is we've, uh, We've whittled down our longer list and we've each picked three and we're just going to talk about each one of them a little bit and why we feel these bands should have been, should have been bigger, why they're considered, why we consider them underrated. So I'm going to have Martin kick us off with his first choice. Okay. Very odd choice. People maybe expect this from me, but they'd never expect it from anybody else because I've uh, always trumpeted the, uh, the virtues of this band. Love, hate, late period hair metal band basically in that dirty metal um, uh, sort of genre that I often consider starts with Guns N' Roses and goes through Skid Row, Dangerous Toys, Sea Hags, blah, blah, blah. But I really, you know, I, we've been having this discussion on, on uh, the net recently about how, how great I think Rat is. And Rat is an interesting band that you could think of as, as underrated, right? But, um, you know, but then I, I keep thinking there was no band better in the hair metal genre than Rat Eat, uh, early on and then later on when you know you kind of did expect these bands to be better when grunge had already come out and, and these bands sort of stood back and said we got to really try harder so there's this whole try harder thing that i i talk about you know go to vancouver record there try harder i did an episode of my history in five songs podcast on called go to vancouver and try harder that was like about you know, your Motley Crues and White Snakes and, and bands like this, like, like everybody basically getting way better, Warrant getting better with Dog Eat Dog and all that kind of thing. But this band right here, people adore this record. They really do. I mean, and they have this really kind of cool look, but it is still a little bit hair, hair metally. Jizzy Pearl, what a great looking front man with when he had the long hair, he looked like a dangerous version of Jim Morrison. Um, but when it comes to uh, a masterpiece, I mean, this is too, but the second record, Wasted in America, this is so, so cool. This is really kind of complicated, well-recorded. They're still on Sony. It's 1992, I believe, right? Yeah, 92. Um, but it's late, right? Nirvana has already come out. But this is really intelligent music, a lot of riffs, um, a lo almost progginess to, to some of the things they do really kind of sleazy lyrics, but really biting lyrics. Great, great vocals out of Jizzy Pearl. Uh, basically a masterpiece of trying super, super hard, but still being somewhat in the hair metal genre. And it's also really heavy. I mean, this, this is a heavy, heavy, aggressive album. 
And then they basically lost their deal and stepped down to Let's Rumble, which also is a really, really good album, but it's a little more raw, less songs on it. Spinning Wheel is on here, The Boozer about drinking, Wrong Side of the Grape about drinking, uh, and just really good turns of phrase. Like he's really a poetic guy. But this band ran into a lot of trouble with um, fighting with each other and some hard drugs in the band as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, the career path is sort of um, partially because of that, but partially because everybody lost their deal once, once grunge hit. No hair metal band was kind of safe. They all, they all you know, went down the ladder really fast. But, I mean, look, I mean, look at that great band shot. There's a band shot on the back of, um, and, and look, at, look at Jizzy, you know, he's just, he's Jim Morrison, right? And the, and the videos, check out the videos off of this album and, and the, you know, the masterpiece early album too. I, 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 forgive me, but I can't remember which guy in the band uh, does these paintings, but these paintings are by um, one of the guys in the band. So the album covers are a little, almost way too abstract to, to make it as well. And then they kind of went downhill, you know, that they're on smaller labels with these other albums, the Let's Eat album. This one's called Living Off Layla, you know, so, so good, good album titles as well. I'm Not Happy, another one of those paintings, but also a pretty cool album. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I've proselytized about this band up and down over the years forever. I absolutely recommend anybody go out and try that second album, Wasted in America, the anthems, the quality of the guitar playing and the riffs. There we go. Um, uh, Martin, Martin convinced me. I, I, I haven't even, I just got it. I haven't even unwrapped it yet. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I just start to finish. Um, just, just amazing, amazing songs. And again, uh, to, to get back to our, our earlier thing, um, there's so many interesting things going on in hooks and anthemic choruses that this is a band where you go, why shouldn't they have been bigger? I think we know the answer. It, it, they came like about two, three years too late. Um, I, I've all, I've always said too, you know, to get in fights with people. I mean, I think love, hate craps on guns and roses from a height of several miles, um, and doing kind of the same kind of music. It's just literally, they're like, they're like the, the massive, massive, massive improvement on guns and roses. That's how great I think love, hate is. Yeah. I, I detect a little bit too, you know, I was thinking about this. It's like, you know, you had a band like extreme, which, you know, a little bit different, but, you know, very kind of busy. The, a lot of the, the really cool guitar works kind of similar. And would Extreme have not been as big as they kind of got? And they weren't an enormous band, were it not for that one? Single. Yeah, the one ballad, the one campfire ballad, more than words. And again, a try harder band, por Pornography is a pretty, pretty complicated try harder album. Yeah. But then they did Three Sides to Every Story, which is even more in that direction, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's kind of like a three sided album, I believe, right? It's sort of like 80, 90 minutes long, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, a, a masterpiece of, of trying super hard to make, to make a really, really great complicated detailed album and there is this clutch of all these records in and around you know 91 to 93 that are that way out of the hair bands and i love those records yeah that's a good choice uh yeah a band that should have had all the tools to do it had all the tools to do it so another band uh my first choice here another band that had all the tools and maybe uh, i think there's a couple of reasons why a band like riot uh never really became that big band. You know, today people talk about Riot like they were like the greatest thing since sliced bread. People who maybe of our age who are listening to this type of music. But I mean, let's face it, Riot were never a really big band. They opened up for all the big bands on the scene, you know, on the tour circuit. They had a couple albums, which a lot of people consider some of the best of the genre. Were they metal? Were they hard rock? Were they a little bit of both? You know, whatever, does it really matter? You know, they had some pretty terrible album covers with this weird kind of seal creature, whatever. But and, you know, and also too, it's like they had like a, almost like a revolving door of lead singers, because I think the eighties, especially, and even the late seventies, uh, was a time where people latched on to bands that had consistent lineups, right? You could, you could relate to the lineup, but this band, you had people coming and going constantly. And I don't think it did them any favors, but you know, this album, all right, I'll pull this one out, you know, the Narita album. Okay. Then you had, you know, Born in America. You know, Thundersteel, maybe you like this one, maybe you don't, I don't know. But specifically, like these three albums, uh, got a lot of attention. Never big sellers, though. Uh, the bigger bands loved them enough to bring them out on tour with them. But, you know, here you had, uh, you know, Guy Speranza, 
great singer. I mean, he just sounds fantastic on this album. You got a bunch of real classic heavy rock songs for the time. Um, but then before you know it, he's gone. They bring in Rhett Forrester, who, you know, totally different singer, different voice, equally as good, you know, maybe to some people. He doesn't stick around either. Then you bring in a guy named Tony Moore. You bring in a guy named Mike DeMio, okay? Mike Torelli and, uh, after him. But the important thing is you had like these songs that were every bit as appealing, every bit as heavy, and stuff that would stick in your brain, just as good as like what you would get from Priest and Maiden and all the other, you know, Scorpions and so on and so forth. In fact, sometimes maybe more so, because quite frankly, you know, I can listen to, you know, some of these albums and think like, wow, these are just absolutely incredible songs that the band should have been headlining, you know, major arenas and people should have been gobbling this stuff up. And I, you know, for me, I don't remember back in the, back in the day, you know, cause I used to read a lot of the uh, hard rock and metal magazines and whatnot, not a lot of press given to these guys, you know, were they kind of faceless because of the constant lineup changes? You know, you've got, uh, you know, Mark, who is the Mark real, who's the real real, however he says his last name, uh, leader of the band for many, many years until his, you know, you know, untimely death. Uh, he was the kind of the one constant in this band, but I, I don't know, man. It's like, uh, so what year did this album come out? Was it 70 fire down on there's 81. <clears throat> Can you think of a lot of albums better than this in 1981? Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I mean, you know, Narita was 1979. Maybe this, maybe this was a little ahead of its time. Yeah. Because I, you just have to wonder if, you know, these, you know, Born in America and Restless Breed, I didn't bring my Restless Breed copy out, but, you know, that was 82, this is 83. Uh, I think, you know, at this time, metal is big, you know, U.S. metal, pretty big. Uh, was, were these guys a little bit too late to the game, too early to the game? Was it kind of a combination of the two? I don't really know, because they're definitely not a hair metal band. They're not a thrash band. Right. It's just like it's just like good old fashioned American hard rock, maybe just not niche enough. I don't know. I, I just I never understood why. And they've got all sorts of albums. You know, I mean, uh, they, there's, they put out, you know, now they're uh, they're under a different name. Right. Riot five, Riot V, whatever you want to call it, whatever. But um, and all good stuff. But, I, you know, I don't know. Is it the bad album covers, Martin? Does that have something to do with it? I don't know. It's, it does. The bad album covers do. And and the timing, I mean, the first album was 77. It was a pretty heavy album for 77. But to get yeah. Narita in 79 is crazy because that's that's the the, the true, um, yeah. you know, trough of heaviness. There's really nothing much happening. In the New Wave of British Heavy Metal, they really loved those guys. Um, there was this petition that was put on to have them come over or, or to actually to get their album deal. I remember that they're, they're on Capitol, so Sammy Hager, they're touring with Sammy Hager. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, 1981 uh, is, is uh, you know, in America, the America uh, or metal hasn't even really hit yet. Um, another big issue, I think, is that they were an East Coast band and they, they didn't move to the West Coast. And then Guy Speranza with that great voice, he's out of the band and they bring Red in. And Restless Breed is a little bit of a mellower, more Southern Rocky sort of album. They do some, some ill-advised covers, I think. I think they were kind of a little bit starved for promotion and money. I mean, I, they definitely I, were. I do recall seeing ads and stuff, but they did have a falling out with Capital. They had a big fight uh, around the time of Fire Down Under, so there were some problems there as well. So, <clears throat> so yeah, timing, but... You're right. You know, good looking guys, great productions, uh, a lot of solid hooks on basically, you know, Narita and, uh, and Fire Down Under are, are masterpieces. Every metalhead loves them. Um, but it's, it's this idea of having um, just, just some of your ducks knotted in a row and things happening. And, and like you say, losing, losing the singer as well and then switching again and even switching a style again. Yeah, it was pretty heavy, but then they became one of the proto original power metal bands. With a absolutely, very sort of yeah, absolutely. Sound. Anyway. I think too. You know, you mentioned the New York thing. I think at the time, so when they were just kind of starting to break a little bit, so in the late seventies, early eighties, they really didn't have that prototypical New York sound, and they also they weren't West Coast sound. So at the time, you got all these bands popping up on you know in California and LA and whatnot. And they definitely didn't sound like them either. I honestly think, and you brought it up before, their sound, at least early on, had way more to do with the new wave of British heavy metal bands than anything else. And I wonder if that hurt them as well. Yeah. 
So, you know, the Brits really probably, you know, could appreciate them, but they weren't one of their own, right? And even here in this country, it's like, well, they really didn't sound like a lot of the bands from the U.S. at the time. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah, and, and, they're, and like I say, they're, they're kind of losing their deal. They're having a big fight with Capitol, so they're not getting promoted, like right when they make that masterpiece of an album, which, uh, <clears throat> you know, I guess Among Metalheads is not an underrated album. I think, I think you know, every single metalhead who knows it knows it as a classic album but uh yeah just uh, just uh, uh, one of these missed opportunity bands yeah absolutely so all right back to martin okay so my second choice i'm gonna go with um you know a band that always comes to mind in this discussion with metalheads it's almost like a cliche uh band that comes to mind but uh, let me find their first album cover here in this whole mess um is uh this band here King's X, always, always, always discussed in this underrated, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really have this discussion without them. Because again, uh, when, when it comes to this sort of definition that we uh, hammered together uh, to come up with this episode, uh, there's, there's this idea that um, I've always felt this and a lot of people feel this is that you can listen to any of these King's X albums and go, there's like five or six smash radio hits on this. Like this should have been a massive song on radio. And also, so there's a lot of sweet um, hooks all over the place. There's gorgeous, gorgeous harmonies, absolutely pristine recordings. They're on Atlantic. Um, who is producing all these records? Yeah, so Sam Taylor and King's X, the band. So Sam Taylor was this sort of Sven Galley guy out of Houston. Um, later, Brendan O'Brien on Dogman. We'll talk about this a little bit. But um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, t ticking off the boxes, they're on a major label. The productions are amazing. They've got this really cool alternate tuning thing going on where it's like really interesting music. I know for a fact Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, like all, all the grunge guys just worshipped King's X, thought they were an amazing, amazing band. They knew how super, super cool they were. They might have had a little bit of a problem early on with this. Uh, they got tagged with this idea of being Christian metal um, because uh, Doug would talk about his cr Christian beliefs a little bit. And there's, there's you know, slight slight um you know religious uh overtones to their lyrics not really a lot classic classic second album gretchen uh goes to nebraska um but you know there was was some pretty good buzz around the band when dogman came out this is produced by brandon o'brien classic band shot on the back walking down the street in these leather trench coats um you know this album came out um we got a lot of uh got a lot of promotion it came out in i think three different colors you can get it in the yellow the red the blue um and uh, like just an amazing classic album like but but super you know so it's 1994 i believe and this is sounding you know they were almost they were almost grunge before there was grunge or during grunge like grunge had a lot of really cool creative different things to it and this you could put them into that aspect they were from texas that might have held them back a little bit um and they didn't move to one of the music capitals um but this has got a super heavy, dirty, grungy sound. Um, but, you know, mixed race band. You've got Doug Pinnock in there. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, he's so he's a black bass player, lead singer, just like Phil Linett. But again, um, I thought he had an amazing, uh, really soulful, cool voice. But, you know, he definitely does have a, a black sort of soulful way of singing. So he's on top of this. So he's adding this extra cool dimension to the band. You've got Ty and Jerry. So Ty on guitar, very progressive band. If you ever see them live, they could just play circles around anything. They're just really, really cool. So there's some proggy stuff to it but lots and lots of songs on each album. They're always short songs. Um, you know, they're a trio. They sounded great. Um, and, you know, I remember interviewing them over the years. They would toss off things like, yeah, we've got about 500 songs we could, we could pull out at any point and put on records. They put out so many records over the years with these great enigmatic album covers, right? That's just the self-titled album. There's the, um, uh, what is that one called again? remember live there's their live album please come home mr bulbous this was a, a bit of a weird album with a weird album cover 
Tape Head is probably my personal favorite. We have a YouTube show called The Contrarians, and I picked this as a contrarian choice of my favorite album uh, of theirs. They were on Metal Blade for all these years, so they have a lot of albums on Metal Blade. This was also on Atlantic, Faith, Hope, Love, great, great record. Um, Ear Candy, also, they were still on Atlantic for this one. Great album cover. Um, you know, and you'd get you'd get Ty in there doing a lot of the singing. So so Ty would sing, uh, Doug would sing, and uh, they'd, they'd really split the vocals up. And, and Ty's songs were even more melodic than, uh, than Doug's. Um, there's the best of King's X album. So even on Atlantic, they, they were good enough to have a best of album, right? <laughs> um, so everybody, there's how they look like, you know, and, and Doug, Doug looks super young for his age. He's like a tall, skinny dude. And now I think he's like 72 years old or something. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's still staying. Amazing, amazing. Manic Moonlight. So, yeah, you just, you just can't leave this band out of that discussion. I mean, literally, you get a bunch of metalheads around and it's, it's like Blois Chacult with album covers. It's like the first band that pops to mind when you, when you say underrated. You yeah, go. and you have to wonder, I mean, you, you kind of said a lot there about probably the reason why they were never bigger than they were. It's like there's just so many things colliding with their music. I, 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 I got to tell you, I don't think I've been asked more over the last couple of years about, you know, Pete, how come you never talk about King's X? Do you not like King's X? And they're, for me, they're a big mystery because they're one of those bands that I should really like and I don't dislike they just never kind of grab me. And I like a lot of bands that do a lot of different things. But I think, you know, you got the soulful, almost like R&B-ish vocals. You've got the kind of a uh, lot of groove, right? You've got little bits of prog. They're kind of heavy, but they're not too heavy. It's like it's almost like they're not heavy enough for the, 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 the metal fans. They're not quite proggy enough for the prog crowd. They're kind of like in this, they're this weird in the middle band that have all this stuff going on that really works. You know, a lot of the Beatles type harmonies, all this stuff. It, you mentioned that. So, so the one thing people say about them to, you know, the short version of like, when you ask, when you're asked, what is, what is King's X like? And the thing that gets brought up all the time is that Black Sabbath meets the Beatles. So they got a lot of doomy stuff and a lot of slow stuff mixed with this Beatlesque quality to them. And, they, and they'll mix those two together or they'll have separate songs. They have, they have tons of ballads that are gorgeous that could have been radio hits. But that's the thing. This is the band that, that when you play the albums with your A&R hat on, with your Monty Connor A&R hat on, right? You basically go, th th that should be like a number two or number three hit single in some universe, right? Yeah. But it's almost like it's, it's a little bit like Blue Oyster Cult where they could be really poppy and really accessible but at the same time, there's a little devil on your shoulder saying, this goes over everybody's head. It's almost too good for the public. And yet, and yet it's super crazy poppy. So it's a conundrum, right? Yeah. Go figure. The band is probably still wondering too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think they're bitter about it over the years. But over the years, they've gathered such a big cult following, a little bit like Motorhead at the end and a little bit like Clutch right now, right? Yeah where they have this big following where it's a dependable, dependable amount of people will buy every record and show up to the shows because they, they are, they're an absolute cult because they're so lovable as guys and as a band that, that you know, the love of King's X is just totally feverish. Yeah, yeah. All right, so my next choice, <clears throat> this is the first one I chose because I, I never understood why this band wasn't enormous. Uh, I've been following since day one. Talk about Sabotage. Mm. All right, so another great US band. Were they power metal? Were they traditional heavy metal? Were they doom? Because they had some doom stuff going on. Were they progressive metal? I think they were kind of all these things and then some. And again, we're, we're talking about some bands here that kind of had a lot of things going on. And, you know, that could have, you know, contributed to the fact that they didn't kind of break that glass ceiling, so to speak. But, you know, when this album came out, damn heavy, uh, you got this absolutely shrieking vocalist, John Oliva, who was kind of like this weird combination of Rob Halford and Ian Gillen, right? I mean, he could just kind of do it all. You have the just virtuoso guitar skills of his brother, Chris, right? The late Chris Oliva. Uh, and you had these songs that were, you know, early on, kind of real dark lyrical themes, but bone crunching heavy. We're talking like, you know, um, mid late seventies Judas Priest heavy. 
but then not far removed from some of the stuff that you were hearing, you know, from at the time, you know, a little Metallica, you know, maybe some of the, the real heavy doomy stuff like candle mass and what have you. So, but they could also be, they could sing real beautiful stuff because John had this other side to his voice. So as we would see throughout their catalog, they would start to incorporate like all this lush pianos and orchestrations. You know, Paul O'Neill starts managing the band. They're on Atlantic Records and their albums are selling good. Again, they're touring with everybody. They're just, they're out in the world all the time. You got Power of the Night, right? Brutally heavy stuff. I mean, just go listen to Warriors. I mean, it's just <clears throat> classic metal. But, you know, for me, like, like this album. Yeah. To me, this is one of the greatest metal albums of all time. Yeah. And yet, this struggled to sell. They still weren't headlining. Um, you know, why? And then you got, you know, at the same time, you got bands like Priest who are pumping out Turbo and Ram It Down and stuff. And then you got this. This is real, honest to God, American, U.S. classic metal right here. Yeah. Um, you know, here we're starting to see. So here the, you know, I think the seeds of what Paul envisioned Trans-Siberian Orchestra uh, kind of really started back here because here you're having all the orchestrations and the keyboards and the strings uh, and the light and the shade in their music. So these big bombastic heavy songs and the more gentle kind of poppy and, vo you know, almost like Broadway style things, right? Very appealing though. You know, it's, it's again, is it, were these guys a little bit too heavy for the mainstream? I don't know, Streets, concept album, right? The rock opera. This kind of stuff was, was big back in the 60s and 70s. But, you know, in the, right around the turn of the 90s, maybe not so much. But you had that voice. You had that guitar, the gorgeous guitar. You had that rhythm section. I mean, uh, production on these albums are all great. Um, you know, then all of a sudden you have, you know, lineups changing. Chris dies, right? Uh, that certainly didn't help them. I think that kind of really stalled them because you had Chris passed away in the accident, right? John got kind of disillusioned with what was going on in the band. Uh, you know, John's had some history with, you know, substance abuse and things like that. So he winds up leaving. You, know, you get Zach in on vocals. The, the sound changes a little bit here. We're becoming more orchestral, a lot more progressive. Uh, and, and now we're, we're in the 90s, right? So now it's like progressive metal is just not seen as, that, that's not cool here anymore. And they release like this string of like really good, like kind of prog metal albums, big bombastic, you know, albums. And then before you know it, Paul says, you know what, let's, because Paul by now is running this band and he's making most of the decisions along with, with John. John is in and out of the band. You got the two vocalists, you got, you know, Al Petrelli comes in, Chris Caffrey comes in. Uh, you get a lot of lineup changes. Uh, and then the seeds for Trans-Siberian Orchestra basically happen with this album. So that becomes this big, you know, even bigger concept, you know, this kind of like symphonic rock band playing holiday music. And then all of a sudden, like, Sabotage is like forgotten. You know, they put out the Dead and pulled the Dead Widder Dead. I mean, the um, uh, a Poets and Madman album, right? But that was the kind of the last thing we've seen from these guys. And yet, to this day, people are always talking about Sabotage. The guys from the band are always talking about, I would love to do Sabotage again. It's like this band that everybody wants to see again. Uh, and now Paul O'Neill's gone, and it's almost like it's, like it's just in limbo. Like he was the only guy who could make the decision, we're going to do this again. And I think just a really beloved band by so many hard rock and metal fans, yet never made it big. These, yeah. these, in my opinion, these guys should have been as big as Priest and Maiden and all those other really huge Metallica and whatnot. I mean, they had the goods. They, there's just some classic albums with some absolutely great songs, killer guitar playing, killer riffs, just out of this world vocals and some really heavy tunes and some actually gorgeous, beautiful songs that were very accessible that, uh, you know, even like MTV wasn't playing them much at all. And when, when they did put out a video, they, the videos were just incredibly cheesy and they would get relegated to, you know, two in the morning headbangers ball or something like that. It's only, the only time you would see them. So, yeah. um, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, for me, this was a no brainer because I, I've been following these guys from the beginning and I just never understood why uh, they weren't absolutely enormous. Yeah. Well, I guess you're, you're not going to be enormous as a prog metal band in the nineties. So that's, that's that, right. but <clears throat> you're right. Hall of the Mountain King, one of the greatest albums of all time as is Sirens, as is Power of the Night, as is the Dungeons Are Calling EP. Yeah, they had yeah. the one career falter with Fight for the Rock where right. 
they, they were basically desperate for a hit and they took some bad advice. It's not recorded very well, but I think that's got wishing well and day after day as covers on it. Yeah. Um, maybe even another cover, um, but just not a very good album. So, so they had this career falter pretty early on. Um, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, the first album was essentially an indie and then later, so they get on Atlantic and then they have this whole different look for power of the night. I remember seeing that in the racks for the first time and it just blew my mind. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's, um, and it is as, as well put together as sirens and you're right about sirens. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing they, they've got, they had, they had a few of those, uh, kind of early nascent, um, speed metal thrash songs but what they did is they they almost kind of had the blueprint going on sirens for what metallica would do on the black album just this big crunchy awesome heavy metal sound that wasn't particularly fast um but yeah i remember hearing sirens for the first time and it literally became one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time it, it almost felt like it was the first best album since all the way sad wings of destiny in 1976 yeah i, I was actually going to bring up sad wings of destiny i think too they also you know based on the kind of the vocal style of oliva if you were like someone who appreciated merciful fate at the time and maybe you wanted something a little more kind of riff based because you know merciful fate pretty proggy and stuff i think sabotage was a good alternative and yeah. they're you know contemporaries yeah. right around the same exactly, time yeah and then john you know you mentioned the substance abuse but also he <laughs> got really big too right yeah. so all of a sudden all of a sudden you're not you know that photogenic as a front man sort of thing um and yeah there there seemed to be some maybe depression there there was definitely some drinking you know obviously you know losing chris right um so yeah who knows and and again that florida band they didn't move to uh california or any of that sort of stuff um, who knows, right? And then, uh, like you say, Trans Siberian takes over, and it's awesome, and it's it's a massive hit. Um, so there's a little bit of that, you know, that Woody Allen thing. Uh, 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 yeah, is it a Woody Allen thing? But it, that that thing of eighty percent of life is just showing up, right? So you're around forever. You know, you're you're you you're going to interview Kurt Vanderhoof too. He got involved with Trans Siberian Orchestra, right? Yeah. So if you're around forever and you're a great talent and you're doing this stuff, something strange might happen. And and to to the sabotage guys, that strange thing that happened was Trans Siberian Orchestra. I mean, who could have predicted that, right? But you stuck around. You had a lot of talent. You tried this, you tried that, some things worked, some things didn't, Fight for the Rock didn't work, Trans-Siberian Orchestra absolutely sort of worked. So they, so those guys found their success, you know, in, in, in the mid, in late, late, I guess, late in their career cycle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, could have been. All right, back to you. Okay, so my last choice is uh, this band right here, Stars. I'm going all the way back to 1976 and 1977. There's their debut album, right? Um, all, all ready with a Van Halen logo, ready to roll, an Angel logo, a Kiss logo. Um, perfect, this, uh, this record came with, uh, with a, a path, I believe, that you, that you could get. But, um, so this is a great choice that feels a little bit like that, uh, like the Riot choice. Um, uh, more more riot than love hate. Certainly not really like King's X. Not really like Sabotage. I, I I'd say, but the reason I think this band should have been massive is um, just really accessible Kiss like songs. They, they sound like a cross between Kiss and Aerosmith and Ted Nugent. Um, great singer in Michael Lee Smith, brother of Rex Smith. This band basically sounded a lot like Rex. I mean, they, they sound, these guys and Rex sounded very similar with elements of those other bands. But, um, so yeah, the first album comes out, they're on Capitol, gets a lot of promotion. It's embossed, so it sticks up, right? Um, good looking bunch of guys, you know, a, a great sort of picture of the band looking all kind of pretty corporate rock and right. You got Joe X Dubé as the drummer up here. You know, there were even, Tama ads at the time with Joe. There he is looking all monstrous. You know, it, it didn't really match the drumming on the albums. The albums were pretty simple drumming. But, you know, the albums were kind of simple, Kiss-like songs, but, but really nice hits. You know, uh, Detroit Girls sounds like a good Kiss song. They're almost like the thinking man's Kiss or the Kiss without the distraction of the makeup and the costume. Although, you know, stars would kind of dress all in black and stuff. Um, but Livewire, um, 
Now I Can was a super heavy one. Boys in Action was a super heavy one. They had the um, notorious hit, Pull the Plug, which is about the Karen Ann Quinlan case from the 70s about, um, you know, uh, should you pull the plug on someone if they're kind of in a, in a col uh, coma type thing. Um, there was a big debate and a lot of news on that. She's Just a Fallen Angel was a big hit. And then they had the second album. Uh, that's not the second album. So yeah, this one right here, uh, Violation. There's, there's a picture of it. An even better album than the debut. Let's not forget also, they're managed by Bill Ockoin, who's, uh, who's Kiss's management, right? So they've got big management. They're on all the tours. They're out there all the time. This had, you know, Cherry Baby was a beautiful, exquisite yeah. pop hit. Um, it came out as a single, picture sleeve single, even in the States. Rock Six Times, good Kiss song. A uh, couple really heavy ones in Subway Terror and, uh, and Violation. Just gorgeous, heavy Kiss-type songs. Again, Thinking Man's Kiss. Um, Subway Terror, I think, was about violence on the subway, possibly about one of the, um, the um, serial killer situations at the time. Cool one, All Night Long. They tried a lot of cool poppy things. Sing It, Shout It is, is very much like a Shout It Out Loud Kiss sort of song. Is That a Street Light or the Moon was a ballad. So kind of mixed it up a little. Produced by Jack Douglas. So it's, you know, ticking off all the boxes, yeah, right? Yeah. Great accessible radio songs, no problem there. But they did the career suicide album. Um, so this is a really, really poppy and simple and <clears throat> thinly produced album. It had two great heavy songs on it in X-Ray Specs, Good Ale We Seek, but the rest of it was really bad. Yeah, I think uh, I remember now, come to think of it, you get home with your vinyl, New Stars album, you're all excited. And I think I played what's called that side. It had this side and that side. So that side had two of the best star songs of all time to start off the side. X-Ray Specs and Good Ale We Seek. Good Ale We Seek always reminded me of uh, Golden Age of Leather. It's a little bit proggy, poppy, heavy, like, like um, Blue Oyster Cult, 77. This is 78. So, so I'm getting this album and I'm playing it and thinking, okay, well, this looks a little suspect. But wow, this is going to be the best Stars album of all time. Once Good Ale We Seek ended, there were no more heavy songs. In the yeah, time. the rest of it goes downhill. Yeah. The whole thing was poppy. Just so annoyed. We hated Stars so much when they did that. So that was 78. <laughs> they came back with a, with a heavier album again, but, but the magic was gone. It, it was a little stiff. The production wasn't that good. This was produced, I, I believe, up in Canada. Um, by what's his name uh jack richardson so this was not a good album yeah per recorded the soundstage toronto for nimbus nine productions jack richardson not a great production um but it's heavy again you know had jack douglas douglas produced this and had you know uh they chucked back a few beers before they made it it possibly would have been a little looser and sounded better but you know so young so bad could have been a radio hit um you know, Outfit, uh, Take Me was heavy, um, Don't Stop Now was super heavy, Coliseum Rock, I believe, was the uh, uh, instrumental, It's a Riot was super heavy, Where Will It End was super heavy. Great songs, but not great playing. They played kind of stiff on it, not great production. But again, so that, and then that was it for Stars. Um, but again, uh, what do we have here? Yeah, so there's your, your Violation ad. Hide your, what is it? Hide, hide your new stars album, uh, Violation. So, you know, they got a lot of press and circus and hit parader and all that. So again, all the boxes ticked off. Everything should have, you know, they should have just been right on the heels of Kiss, just like Angel, right? Stars and Angel. You put them in the same camp almost. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and, and a great lead singer and front man and all that stuff. Uh, everything going for them. Uh, but they just never broke through. Richie Rano was quite bitter about the whole thing. They should have broke through. I remember Richie oh, still to this day complains about, uh, uh, you know, the one time they got reviewed in Rolling Stone and it was kind of a lukewarm review or a negative review. And he never, he never forgave this Chris something or other for that review. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so he's a little bitter about it and I can understand why, because with all of this stuff going for them, um, they, they should have had, you know, hits for miles. So there you go. Yeah. No, it's my good choice. Yeah, I had a like about an hour and a half conversation with Richie Rano about two years ago. And he, yeah, he's still really bitter. And he'll go on and tell you how the label screwed them, the management screwed them. And now every 
he told me, he said, I have talked to so many bands and musicians who were part of the hair metal scene and they all cite stars as one of their biggest influence. He goes cheap trick and told me personally that stars was one of their biggest influence. He wow. goes, and we kind of lost our way a little bit with, you know, that third album he goes, but still those first two albums should have been huge. And, but we just got screwed left and right. Mm. And yeah, but you're right. You tick all the boxes are ticked off, right? Yeah. All of them. Yeah. Oh, uh, well. All right. On to our last choice of today. So um, I couldn't not pick these guys. Uh, I'm going to go with Badlands. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, I mean, again, we're, uh, what year was this? This was 89. 1989, right? So right at the end of what we, you know, call the hair metal era, right? Or the, the big years of metal and hard rock, right? So we've got, uh, you know, grunge and alternative right around the corner, just a couple couple of years. But, you know, we've still, we've got some bands at the time who were doing really big business that are still, you know, like White Snake, pretty big still in 89. They're kind of like that, you know, Guns N' Roses, certainly the kind of the bluesy kind of sleazy rock, right? And then you've got, you know, Jake is now out of, Jakey Lee is now out of Ozzy's band. He's puts together this band, you know, with, uh, Great guys in the band. Of course, you got uh, Ray Gillen, who spent some time in uh, Black Sabbath. He spent, he had a cup of coffee with Blue Murder, right? And then forms this band, you know, a lot of, you know, Eric Singer, all sorts of other guys. You got uh, Paul O'Neill managing, producing the band. Uh, they're on Atlantic Records. So you think, all right, so what's Jake got? So we know Jakey Lee at the time. He was in Rat briefly in the beginning, joins Ozzy's band, right? And then all of a sudden, here we have this album, which is like, throwback 70s bluesy hard rock and really good bluesy hard rock too i mean they were putting out uh, videos these guys were out touring opening for bigger bands you, know, you got high wire dreams in the dark winners call dancing on the edge you know all sorts of great stuff on here did this even go gold i don't even i don't even know if it went gold no it didn't right yeah uh why why not again you gotta wonder was it a little too late? I had this, I had a similar conversation with uh, Carmen and Peace the other night about Blue Murder. It's like Blue Murder came out right around the same time, maybe two years too late, maybe a year too late. I think if you back up like one to two years, because I think if this album comes out right around the same time that White Snake's 1987 album comes out, this does huge business. Or and you have to wonder. Seven, right? Yeah. After right. The destruction. Yeah, exactly. So I, you have to wonder if Atlantic Records by this time are already thinking, you know what, this whole big bubble is going to burst. You know, we're going to sign these guys. Paul's probably bugging us to death to sign them. We're going to sign them, and, but we're not going to do anything with them. And then, you know, they put this album out, uh, what, two years later? And by now, grunge is, all, is already happening. So you've got this album comes out, uh, just as gutsy an album. Not, I mean, these albums are very similar to each other. Great playing, great songs, great vocals. All right, you know now we've got the issues between Ray and uh, and Jake. Right, Ray's getting gets sick and all this kind of stuff. There's all this stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, the band basically implodes. You know they 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 record this said you know this album in the studio. It never officially gets released till years later. Before you know it, uh, you know Ray's gone, the band is gone. Jake kind of goes in hiding for, you know, many, many years. We don't really see much of him throughout the rest of the decade. And these guys get like completely forgotten. Major label band, right? Made up of major label players. Great albums. And it just didn't happen. Just to, but nowadays, and again, with a lot of these bands we're talking about here today, nowadays people remember these bands fondly. And I think everybody scratches their head and they're like, why were these bands not huge? And it's like, it's the same across every single one of them. Yeah. You know, not lack of label support, timing not right, lineup changes, uh, bands break up before they become, it's just, it's just amazing. So I think Badlands for me, can't miss stuff. You release this album in 1974, it does huge business. You release this album in 85, 86 or seven, I think it does big business. But you know what, in 89, 91, probably not. Yeah. Yeah, and they deserve to be here because 89 also in a way is not too particularly, particularly late where you go, they really could have just caught, they caught the end of that, right? Um, and you're right, White Snake's big. This whole bluesy hair metal thing is starting to get big. But Poison, Great White, Cinderella, they're all pretty bluesy. Uh, you know, the, it's got that, that cool iconic album cover, you know, which is basically saying a little bit like, let's, let's correct on this hair metal thing and just get more real, right? And uh, 
and yeah, there was some friction with the label as well. And, um, you know, you mentioned being on a major label and, and most bands will tell you it's a bit of a cliche, but they, they do say that in the seventies, if you were on a major label, you would, you would have more kicks at the cat kicks at the can, whatever to, uh, to basically, um, you know, try to make it. But at this point, you know, with grunge coming on strong, there's a lot of, there's a lot of panic going on and, and it's, and it's pretty, you know, it's, it's not surprising that they would have the two albums and that would be it. They would be gone. And, and that second album is a little more obscure and a little bluesier. Right. Um, and yet the, the, the album cover of it is a little more of a hair metal album cover. I, I think it was <laughs> yeah, a, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Illustration, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, they, they, they probably, um, you know, with, with having this great lead singer and, and they're a great looking band and the videos were really good too. Um, and with bluesy hair metal being kind of a, a pretty famous thing at that time and, and doing, doing pretty well. Um, yeah, uh, uh, they, they, they should have made it. Yeah, and it had to have been disheartening for Jake, too, because, you know, here's a guy who, you know, he's from the, the L.A. scene and he joins Ozzy's band as that kind of, you know, that replacement for Randy. Uh, maybe not 100% in his comfort zone, what this kind of stuff that Ozzy was doing, but made a big name for himself, probably made a good amount of money, and then got the chance to do something that he really wanted to do. Because I always got the impression that Badlands is that's Jakey Lee. That's yeah. what he wanted to do. And it didn't quite happen. And then he just disappeared for years. So you got to wonder if like the bad taste that was left in his mouth after this band kind of soured him on the industry for quite a while. And that's a real shame. And you've, you've heard that story, you know, all throughout rock history of, of great musicians who had these weird moments where they were in a band and it just, for whatever reason, I mean, Richie Rao is the perfect example of it, right? It's like that, what should have been a big deal wasn't. And, and here you have these guys who work so hard to perfect their craft, to put out this great music, and they're just completely soured on the industry because it just didn't happen for all these various reasons, right? Yeah. Cool. Good choice. So there you have it, guys. Uh, that's three each of our, what we feel are underrated bands. So curious to see what everybody uh, feels about our choices as well as your own choices. But just remember, uh, really think hard about what underrated means to you. Uh, like, like Martin and I said at the top of the hour, it's like, you know, we had to shy away from picking bands that we love, that we would have loved to have seen bigger. But, but the more you think about it, you want there, it's totally understandable why they weren't bigger, right? So the, we really tried hard to pick some bands that we feel help, help, have all of the, all the tools, all the elements that made them a band that should have been as big as all of their contemporaries at the time. So, so really think about that before you start putting your choices in the comments below, because I want everybody to really think about what does underrated really mean, right? Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, like, I, like Martin and I were talking when we first started hashing this out. It's like, you know, my, one of my main choices, like, well, how about Gentle Giant, right? One of the all-time great prog bands, right? I feel they underrated, should have been bigger, but then Martin was like, he's like, but do you ever think that in any piece of reality that Gentle Giant would have ever been as big as Yes and Genesis and Rush and so on and Pink Floyd. And I'm like, the more I thought about it, I'm like, hey, you know what? They probably were exactly where they were always meant to be. As great as they were, as different as they were, Gentle Giant in any universe is probably not going to be a million selling band. Pretty eccentric sounding, right? I mean, right. they, they kind of, they were proggy, but they played loose sometimes, right? There's some yeah. loose as to what they did. And they also had kind of like high yelpy vocals and stuff. And there's a, there's a little bit of a, you know, there's a lot of eccentricity to them. Right. So, yeah. 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 You, so exactly. many, you say the same, you know, we said the same thing about Budgie. It's like, I, I kind of wanted to pick Budgie because I mean, man, one of the, you know, originators of that big heavy proto metal sound and all this kind of stuff. But then the more we talked about it, it's like, well, you know what, really weird song titles, the songs aren't really accessible. Yeah, there's big, great, you know, proto metal riffs and I'm sure influenced a lot of bands, but then you got, you know, uh, the, the, the vocals are kind of high pitched and they go from, you know, heavy to light to a little psychedelic to folky. And it's like, maybe Budgie were always, you know, where they were meant to be. So that's what we really thought hard about this and tried to pick bands that had all the tools. They had yeah, all the yeah, elements. Picture picking up the Billboard charts and seeing new disintegrating parachutist woman, uh, you know, <laughs> one notch above. You're the greatest thing since powdered milk. Or, exactly. And yeah. the next hot as a doctor's armpit, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so, but an interesting topic nonetheless. And uh, I, like I said, I think all these bands we talk about today deserved a little better. 
you know, unfortunately it didn't happen. So there you have it. Uh, this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Make sure you uh, hop on over to Martin's website and check out all of his books that are available, including the new uh, Rush book called Limelight. He's also got the first book, The Anthem from the 70s. Limelight's the 80s. He's got the third one coming out at some point, I'm sure, next year. Um, as well as uh, check out Martin on uh, The Contrarians here on YouTube. Uh, Banger TV, all that good stuff. Martin's all over the place as well. So, uh, and he'll be back here uh, next week at this same time, I would imagine. So, uh, for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good one, everybody. We'll see you real soon. Bye bye.